Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be around the world. And thank you for joining today's uh, Scrum.org webinar, uh, Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer with Martin Hinshelwood. My name is Eric Neyberg and I'll be your host today. I run uh, marketing and operations here at Scrum.org and uh, hopefully I'll be able to take lots of your questions and help you through those questions and answers uh, to them. So uh, if we go to the next slide, Lindsay. This se seminar series is really an opportunity for you as, uh, as an audience to ask your pressing questions. Um, we, we run these on a monthly basis, sometimes a little more frequently, and, and it really gives you an opportunity to meet with one or more of our professional scrum trainers to ask them the questions that you're struggling with, uh, get some feedback, maybe bounce some ideas off and, and, and so on. And if we don't address your questions, uh, we will respond via email post webinar uh, to hopefully answer the ones that we don't get to. Traditionally, we get quite a few questions uh, constantly coming in throughout. So uh, we try to get to as many as we can, but often uh, trying to stick to that time box, we do run out of time. Next slide. So just briefly, who is Scrum.org? Scrum.org was founded by Ken Schwaber. Uh, who is the co-creator of Scrum, and he continues to lead our organization as our chairman. I talked to him uh, actually late, late last night. Uh, so Ken is doing well, continuing to work on and improving Scrum, uh, and, and that's one of the things that we do is we put out a lot of free resources, a lot of content. Uh, Ken continues to author with Jeff Sutherland the Scrum Guide and put that information out there. We also teach classes, as you can see, and, and provide certifications. Next slide. So with that, I will hand it over to Martin to introduce himself. Uh, we're gonna do this one a little bit differently than we've done in some of the past. Uh, Martin was having a little bit of internet trouble the last few days, so we're gonna go without uh, video just to reduce some of the bandwidth. Martin? Hey, uh, hey everybody, my name's uh, Martin Hinchewitt. Um, I'm uh, obviously a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org, um, but I'm also a, a Microsoft MVP um, in, in, well, I guess it's developer technologies, but for want of a better expression, uh, the DevOps side of developer technologies. So I work a lot with organizations around the world to help them uh, just get better at delivering software, whether that be through uh, uh, Scrum or, or Kanban, but also through uh, uh, DevOps tools um, and, and increasing the speed of that pipeline of delivery as well. Um, I, I kind of live in two places. Uh, I, I live in uh, 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 Europe and Scotland uh, for, for some part of the year. Um, I travel most of the time uh, for work, but uh, I also have a, a house in Puerto Morelos uh, in uh, Mexico. Uh, where uh, I, I stay with my my wife, and we're currently renovating a house, so I'm I'm down there just now. Hence, uh, the bandwidth problems. Uh, we're in a little fishing village uh, uh, that does not get awesome internet. <laughs> Great, thanks, Martin. So, Lindsay, if we can go to the next slide. So, to ask your questions, please uh, use the questions box, as you'll hopefully see it. And some people are already finding it uh, on the. Uh, on the GoToWeb and our control panel, ask those questions. Please uh, s send those and, and we'll take them as they come in. So with that, let's get started. So we have our first question uh, from Danny. Uh, do you use liberating structures in your Scrum events? Uh, which ones? And can you give some examples on how you use them? And just um, to, to let you know, Danny, and you may know this, and maybe that's why you're asking, we actually have our, our PSM2, Professional Scrum Master 2 class, um, is very much based on, on the liberating structures format and, and how that class is taught. Uh, Martin, do you have some thoughts on using liberating structures in, in Scrum events? Yes, I, I do. I, I'm actually, I'm just getting started uh, diving into the liberating structures world. Um, I, test, uh, I went through the, the PSM2 uh, with Barry and Christian uh, three months ago, maybe four months ago. Um, and it really opened my eyes to the value of liberating structures 
um, in, in, in organizing Scrum events. Um, I think I would be hard placed to remember the names of the liberating structures uh, that, that we used. I'm still working out how to integrate them um, into, into my, my training myself, as well as with my, my customer scrum teams. Um, so we've, we've tried a few things, but again, I'm trying to remember the names um, of any of the liberating structures that I've used, but the names is totally escaped me at this moment in time. Uh, I can quite happily reply over email with uh, some of the, the, the liberating structures that works for, for different um, events in Scrum. So I don't think I can give a, a better answer than that, just because I, I can't remember the names and you're specifically asking that. No worries. Thanks, Martin. And yeah, if they come to you. My, 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 liber my liberating structures cards are actually in the other room. And I did I did contemplate running through to get them so I could check the names, but um, maybe better uh, uh, over email for a longer conversation. That works great. Thanks. Um, so here, here's one that uh, I know you've recently started teaching the uh, PSU class, Professional Scrum with uh, User Experience class. And uh, Joseph asks a question that's kind of tied to that. How do you incorporate a design sprint in Scrum? And of course, I know the first part is there is no design sprint in Scrum, but PSU teaches you how to incorporate user experience with Scrum. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think... Um... There's two parts to that question. There's how do you incorporate UX into Scrum, and then the the part that it seemed like was specifically being asked, which was how do you incorporate the design sprint into Scrum. And I I, I really think you don't. I I'm not a fan of um, any sort of specialized uh, uh, sprint structure. Um, so no 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 sprint zeros and to me a design sprint seems a lot like a, like a sprint zero um, I wanted the team to just get started uh, uh, building some of the software build the most valuable piece first um, and if that incorporates some of the um, how would you describe it some of the the, the the outcomes that a design sprint would have uh, then all the better um, just incorporate that uh, design work into the, into the uh, sprints itself. And that is ultimately what uh, we're teaching in the PSU, how to uh, bring uh, uh, those UX ideas and run them inside of uh, 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 the normal sprinting structure. Um, I like to think of uh, UX, for, for, for me, there are a number of specialisms that exist within uh, a, a development team. You've got coders, you've got uh, test, you've got security, uh, you've got architecture and you've got UX and you've got DevOps and you've got other things. Um, all of those things are important. They all have to work together and they all need to be part of the engineering team delivering, delivering software. Um, just like I don't expect there to be an architecture sprint, I don't expect there to be a, a, a design sprint either. Um, but all of that work still has to happen. Um, it has to happen just in time, yeah? not, not too late. Uh, so making sure that you, you have the things ready for that moment in time. And I think for, for UX, uh, just as the other disciplines, there's kind of... Uh, two parts to that that work. There's the the work that occurs um, in sprint with the engineering team for the current sprint, and then you've got refinement, which happens all the time. Um, so the the development team should be cons constantly doing a refinement of the things that are coming up in the future, um, and part of that refinement might be uh, uh, doing some design work. Uh, doing wireframes, uh, getting paper prototypes in front of uh, uh, actual users, running through those tests, uh, running through usability scenarios with users with the existing version of the application and seeing where the improvements can be made. And that's going to add more things to the backlog. That's going to refine the things that are already on the backlog. 
So it just adds to the burden of, of the, the team's uh, requirements for, for refinement. Um, same as, as, as all the other refinement around security, around architecture, around uh, coding and engineering practices, around DevOps, what, what are we going to do over the next uh, uh, three sprints uh, to best benefit and provide value in the product? Great, thanks, Martin. And yeah, I mean, we need to prove out our hypothesis. Uh, the, the, I know for, for me, anytime I've been working in UI, uh, pictures don't really work because you can't click on them, you can't touch them, you can't feel mm -hmm. them. Um, and they often, people say they look great and then all of a sudden uh, they go to use it and it's not, doesn't do exactly or what they expected. So getting that feedback, proving out those hypotheses rather than designing, spending all this time designing something that maybe isn't what really ends up being built is, is a great thing. So perfect, thank you. Yeah. Um, Alexandra asks a question. Um, so imagine you've already provided your project stakeholders with training in Scrum. After the initial phase of trying to apply the concepts, uh, when the first obstacles start to be encountered, some of the stakeholders begin to resist adoption. Uh, what's your strategy for handling uh, some of these ex uh, situations? What experiences do you have in, in getting people over the hump, right? Everything's perfect in training and then all of a sudden um, reality sets in. It's, it's hard, especially when you have those uh, uh, significant uh, detractors, uh, people that are, are maybe looking at, um, yeah, this was a great idea on paper, uh, it was a great idea in training, but now we're actually doing stuff in the real world. Uh, and I hear that a lot from, from organizations, from teams, from stakeholders. Um, in the real world, it doesn't work that way. And I think the, 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 the reality that's hard to get across is that Scrum is, is for the real world. Uh, traditional project management is not for the real world. That's for a world that used to exist, but doesn't exist anymore. It was for managing factory workers. Uh, now we're knowledge workers and we need a different method uh, to make that work. And yes, there is a, a, a big hump for people to get over. As for, for tackling that, um, I've tackled that in a number of ways in organizations. One way I find works uh, really well is workshops that, that target, that bring everybody together. So all the different disciplines, including that particular uh, 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 person and work through a scenario with them and see how that collaboration and the input from everybody changes what might have been. Um, I find quite often when uh, uh, the old Tayloristic model of isolation for the different roles and decisions made in isolation, uh, uh, when, when those decisions are made, they're very focused on that thing, uh, be it architecture, be it uh, uh, coding, um, to the detriment of the other things around it. And I think that person, if you can find the thing that they care about and show that the new process is going to provide them with added value, um, the people fairly quickly, when they see what they get from it, they fairly quickly uh, uh, come on board. So I would focus on figuring out what that person uh, wants, what's their reason for not wanting to do it and figure out how to um, change that mind. Um, I find that the, I, I know you said that the, um, your team, your group, your organization has already uh, been through training, uh, but I find a lot of scrum training is not very practical. It, while it, it, it gets across a lot of the um, theory, if you're not already bought into it, Understanding the theory and the mechanics and how you go about things uh, it doesn't 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 help. You need to actually be bought in first. Your brain needs to be convinced uh, that it is actually going to work in the real world. Um, so I always recommend customers to start with the the PSF, the Professional Scrum Foundations, because we actually build software in that class. Uh, so, so all of the people in the class, maybe you have 25 people in the class, break into teams of five, um, and each of them get exactly the same requirements 
for the product uh, at the beginning of the class and they have to go and um, build that software and then iterate on it over four sprints. And that physical realization of how much work they were able to do in the small amount of time that they've got in the two-day class for the actual sprint, as well as the difference between all of the different value deliveries. So if I had uh, uh, 20 people in the class, then I'm going to have uh, uh, four teams building software. Those four different outcomes from the same requirements, it really starts to focus people on why creative work is so different from factory work because it's not the same thing. Um, and, and I think there are other exercises you can do in smaller groups around that. I think tastycupcake.org um, has a few of those. Uh, I think it's run by a, a couple of the PSTs um, and it, it has quite a few exercises around um, creating that idea that knowledge work versus factory work and how, why, why that difference needs to be made. I don't know, I'm not sure if that helped. I maybe rambled a bit. I think that's great, Martin. Thank you. And I'm going to post in the um, tastycupcakes.org. I'll throw a, uh, I'll throw the link in the chat so people have it as well. Once we, uh, as we continue through here. So if, the next if, question. Also, I, I, okay. I would say if if any of my my answers, if I get the wrong end of the stick as well, people should feel free to email me me directly, or I get uh, through through scrum.org. Um, and, and get clarification as well, because I, I, I may just get the wrong end of the stick in the question as well. Sure, and feel free to ask follow-up questions also. Uh, hopefully we'll get to them. So uh, here's another one. How do, how do you keep your teams fully engaged in a, in a context where the schedule and budget are not a factor for motivation? So people aren't being motivated by the schedule or by the budget. How do we keep people motivated to, to keep driving toward, toward an end? That's a really good, really good question. And I, I think uh, there's a few things that, that can help there. The first is the sprint itself. Um, you've got a short period of time, usually two weeks, where you have a goal, a thing you're trying to achieve um, in mind. Uh, that's, that's the first thing that helps do that because then you're not, you're not looking at a date that's 18 months away and then procrastinating for 18 months working on the easy stuff or the stuff you want to work on and leaving all the risky hard stuff till later. Um, you're, you're focused on what's the next most important thing we can do uh, to deliver value. And the sprint goal helps with that um, because when we're working, uh, knowledge workers are working on stuff, we want to feel like the work that we're doing has some benefit to somebody, improves somebody's life, makes things better for, for somebody. That's, that's the thing that makes us as knowledge workers, as coders happy that somebody's using our software, getting some benefit and are happy uh, using our software. So um, having clear uh, uh, sprint goals that allow us to, to understand what it is we're trying to achieve and then getting the outcome of those sprint goals, so the working software we just created in front of the users, the stakeholders at the sprint review, getting that feedback, interacting with those uh, 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 users and seeing whether what we've done makes them happy, uh, uh, benefits them, and then feeding back in that loop, I think is the thing that keeps getting that part right is the thing that keeps us motivated, keeps us going. You know, we're doing something we enjoy. We're providing value to our uh, 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 stakeholders, people that are using our software, um, and we're, we're 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 doing good things. I think is is really important. Um, the other side is is continuous learning. Um, I'll never forget a, a, a job that I took um, as an employee before I became a, a, a consultant and contractor. Um, working for a, a bank in the UK and on my first day in the job the guy that was sitting next to me at the big row of desks like they have in in, in Europe a big open plan office with about 5,000 people in it um, 
the guy sitting next to me was a UX uh, designer, uh, UX expert, and he said uh, to me that he considered himself unemployable because he hadn't done anything new in four years. Um, and I think he's not going to do a good job. He's not going to care about the work that he's doing. Um, and that comes down to no understanding of what value he was providing to customers along with the other people in the team, no continuous learning to, to feel like not only are you improving uh, 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 the value to customers, providing uh, some benefit to them, but also I want to feel like I'm getting better at the work that I do. Um, I want to feel like I'm learning something. I want to do something different. I want to pick up new techniques, try stuff, experiment, get better at the things that I do. And I think they're all uh, important. There's, there's some really good background on that from uh, Dan Pink has a, a book called Drive, uh, which I really recommend uh, uh, reading. It's on Blinkist as well. So if you have a Blinkist subscription, there's like a 15 minute overview, which gets the rough point. Uh, but the book is, is, is awesome. I have it on Audible. I have a, a copy of the book, um, read it a number of times. And Dan Pink talks about uh, what truly motivates people. And I think his subtext is the surprising truth about what motivates people. Because the traditional mentality about what motivates people is that uh, uh, carrot, carrot in the stick. Um, but carrot in the stick is the, the Tayloristic uh, 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 turn of the century industrial revolution uh, thinking that was designed to manage factory workers um, that is just still pervasive today. Um, and the, 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 the core uh, thing that motivates knowledge workers like all of us um, is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So you've got autonomy, which is we want to feel like we're making our own decisions. And if you look at the Scrum Guide, nobody, not even the Scrum Master, tells the development team how to turn backlog items into working software. They have autonomy to make decisions amongst themselves, make choices, build uh, the thing that they want to build within the context of the sprint goal. Um, so that gives them autonomy. Uh, but you've got to balance that autonomy with align larger organizations and I certainly have some ideas around that um, you've got uh, mastery I want to be good at my job I don't want to come in and do a bad job today like a, a bad job yesterday I'm going to do a bad job today and I'm going to do a bad job tomorrow that's not going to motivate me uh, but if I come in and think about mastery of my profession um, I can I can get better at what I do and having purpose uh, uh, purpose is served by the, the sprint review, the, the fulfilling the sprint goal, seeing the users interact with your software, um, even doing, doing usability tests and seeing, uh, getting that extra information uh, uh, to build a better product and make people's lives. Oh, Martin, did we lose you? No, nope, I'm good. Oh, I just kind of stopped. I stopped <laughs> at the end of a sentence, and I was kind of done. But yeah, no problem. Cool. Thank you. Um, so next question: uh, Can can you provide a little bit of context and, and maybe help folks understand value delivery with the Scrum team and how how do they best communicate value delivered to the product owner and the stakeholders? Okay, give me a second to think about that one. Sure. So, so I, I would expect that not to be needed to be explained or imparted to the product owner because the product owner should be the one driving that value. They're the ones that understand the market. They're the ones that should understand the customer. They're the ones that are looking at what's the next most important opportunity for change in our products that will benefit uh, our, our company, our customers, our, our users, uh, whatever the, the context is, um, and, and uh, show that value. So I, I think if you're having to explain that to a product owner, you don't have a very good product owner. Um, 
they need to be focused on those things. That's that's their their responsibility is the product backlog, what's coming up next, understanding the product. Um, so hopefully uh, you can just convince them to 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 um, work on that stuff, get better at it. The team can help. That's absolutely perfect. The development team should be helping them um, achieve that, working together collaboratively, but they are accountable for that. So uh, um, I don't think uh, you should have to explain that. Uh, the stakeholders are a different matter. Um, the sprint review is specifically the entire Scrum team plus stakeholders. Uh, so whether those stakeholders be people paying money for the software, but not be using it, or people uh, 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 physically using it, or sponsors, or whatever that may be, you want to get them into the sprint review. Um, the sprint review, getting stakeholders into the sprint review is your tightest feedback loop. Uh, if they give you feedback after the sprint review, then you can't get it into the current sprint. You've got to get it into the next sprint. So if you're doing two week sprints, that could be four weeks away before they see that 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 change. Uh, but if they can get that feedback to you during the sprint review, then maybe you can show them the outcome in two weeks because that's the most important thing to change or it's a small enough difference uh, to be able to, 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 to implement it very quickly out with the, the, the work for the sprint goal and just get that, that happy user, happy stakeholder. And that's the thing to focus on to uh, get them to come back. So if you can get feedback from stakeholders in that review and then in two weeks invite them back to see the outcome of that feedback i.e what based on it or what you changed based on it then they're going to be engaged yes if i provide feedback it actually makes a difference so getting users to see that in some sometimes you're going to need to do things that are less important for the overall uh, uh, product or overall value from the product owner's perspective, but it gets a stakeholder engaged in the process so that as you move forward with the important stuff, that stakeholder remains engaged and starts giving you feedback uh, uh, on those, those things. Uh, the other thing to do is try and prevent, uh, that prevents the wrong word, try and encourage both the development team and the product owner uh, not to provide um, uh, 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 ad hoc one-on-one -on -one backlog discussions with stakeholders. I, I, and I'm not saying it as an absolute, which is why I'm saying encourage. You want to encourage the stakeholders to come to the sprint review. Um, not only do you get the value of more stakeholders in the sprint review, therefore more feedback, therefore tighter feedback loop, um, but you also get the advantage of transparency. Instead of the product owner and a stakeholder having a conversation privately and the product owner being browbeat, uh, browbeat, browbeaten, I think that's the expression, browbeaten uh, by the, 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 the stakeholder into making their thing that they think is super important, more important than it really needs to be. They have to have that conversation in a public forum so other stakeholders get to be able to uh, uh, rebuff that argument that it's more important and say, well, actually, it's uh, these other things are going on. These other things are more important. The market's shifting. Uh, we need to focus on this first. Transparency um, and getting those conversations into the sprint review um, is really important. Great. Thanks, Martin. So. Um... Moving on to money, how, how do we budget in, 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 in Agile? Um, finance is always asking us, oh, we need to, to understand the budgeting. So could, do you have some ideas, some thoughts on, um, on budgeting models in, in Agile and in Scrum? I, 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 I do that organizations make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be because they like to keep lots of people busy because that's the traditional model. The traditional Tayloristic model is we're going to have an accounting budgeting department 
that accounting budgeting department uh, we now have lots of people in that department therefore we need to keep lots of people busy therefore we need to figure out a more complicated way to do budgeting in order to have lots of people busy um, I, i'm being a little bit facetious there uh, but that's that's how that occurs the the manager of the budgeting department has to be able to um uh, 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 um, defend their headcount, uh, therefore they need work for those people to do. Um, I think in the Scrum world, um, it's, a, it's a lot simpler than that. Um, it's, I have five people on a Scrum team, I have uh, 10 Scrum teams, therefore I have uh, 50 people on 10 Scrum teams, um, and I know exactly how much uh, those people cost because I, my company pays their wages so we know what the cost for each scrum team is you multiply that over the number of sprints you do in a in a in a year that's how much money you need as an engineering team for the year to work on the most important thing for the business so the key the key problem that we run into with the old Tayloristic model is that um, when you're doing budgeting and you say we've got 50,000 for this project and we've got 50,000 for this other project, so project A has 50,000 and project B has 50,000, what if project A over the course of the three months you're going to deliver both projects separately with separate teams, all, all lovely scrum working really well, what if project A becomes a lot more important to the business? Can you, can you, do you have the facility to move teams from project B to project A because it's become more important? Um, a really good example of, of this, I think, is the, the Azure DevOps team at Microsoft. Uh, the way they do it is they have, uh, uh, they have 42, I can't remember the exact number, let's call it 42, I think that was the last I heard. They have 42 teams. They have 42 teams of about uh, uh, 10 to 12 people. So each team has a cost. That's their, that's their budget for the year. They know they're going to work on the most valuable things in that product. But that product, I know it's one product, which is more complicated for, for bigger companies where we have portfolio. Um, but that one product has five main areas of that product that are very different. You've got, you've got um, uh, 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 source code management, you've got um, build, you've got release, you've got work item tracking um, and reporting, but you've got those, those sections. Where do you, as a, as a manager of all of those teams, where, where do you need to have the most investment? Is it work item tracking this year or is it work item tracking the first half of the year and then the second half of the year, you're gonna to have to spend more time in source control because uh, uh, somebody else has released a feature that you need to catch up on. You, you don't know that stuff up front. You need to have, I have 42 engineering teams. That's my budget, because I know exactly how much that's gonna cost. And I'll allocate those 42 engineering teams to whatever the next most important thing is on a sprint by sprint basis. Now that may not change hugely over the period of the sprint, but maybe you need to move three teams from one product to another product because we need to show more progress on this other product. So I think budgeting actually becomes much easier in the Scrum world. I've got 10 scrum teams. This is what it costs to run those 10 scrum teams for a year. I think 10 scrum teams is enough to build all the things that the business is going to ask for. There's my budget. Um, I know organizations try and make it more complicated than that, but that's one of the things that I try and unpick when I go into organizations um, because it's really not, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Today, what the, we're we're at the end of we're beginning of sprint planning. What is the next most important thing for the business today? That that should be where you spend the money, not where the budget's been allocated eighteen months ago or three months ago. Make sense? 
Great. Yep. Thanks, Martin. Um, so the next one, I'm not sure what your experience is here, so we can pass on it if, if you don't have an answer, which is totally cool as well. We can't know everything. Uh, but this is around yep. using Scrum and data analytics. Um, do you have any examples or, or any suggestions ah. around um, using Scrum and data analytics, which is traditionally much more of a waterfall type approach? Yep. And uh, yes. And I maybe don't have any good answers. Um, I worked for three years on a business intelligence team um, at Agreco, uh, which is a big generator company. So they had data coming in from um, all of their running generators around the world, fuel consumption, performance, maintenance, all kinds of stuff. And they built uh, um, a really big uh, data analytics system. And it was very, very difficult um, to break things down into smaller chunks so that you could do uh, more iterative work. Um, that was before I started uh, down the, into the, my journey into the Scrum world. Um, and we didn't do a very good job of breaking things down into, into smaller chunks. Uh, I have since worked with um, organizations uh, 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 one particular organization in the UK, which uh, uh, analyzes a lot of the student uh, data from universities. So all the universities in the UK send them their data, they do some anal analytics, uh, provide uh, an interface to that data. Uh, so the data is different, a little bit different every year, um, and the features, they need to keep up with the, the features that they can provide. Um, and they've done a number of things. Uh, in order to move from the old world of big waterfall projects into the new world of Scrum. And most of that has happened ad hoc, okay? So um, as, an, as an engineer, I don't like what I'm going to say, but <laughs> as, a, as a, this is just the reality, it's an engineering problem to go solve it's not a business problem to go solve, okay? So the business problem is I want to see what's going on more frequently. I want more transparency. Therefore, I need more frequent releases of something I can use, yeah? That's the business problem. The engineering problem is go figure out how to make that work. Um, a good example, I know it's not data analytics, is the, the, the Windows team. At Microsoft, because they're they're what, four thousand five hundred software engineers working on Windows. I mean that's just ginormous, and they were told by Satya, the business problem is we're not getting our users the right features at the right time. I want to see working software in production every thirty days. You know, there's a lot of screaming, and you can't do that, and that's not how our software works on the other side. That's not the business's problem to go solve. That's an engineering problem to go solve. Over the last, I don't know, how long have they been doing Windows 10? Uh, two years longer than it's actually been released. Yep. Maybe four, four years, five years, something like that. Over that time, they've had to rebuild their entire engineering pipeline. They've had to rework how they deliver features to customers, so their architecture of their product has changed significantly. How their teams are organized has changed significantly in order to align with that, with that new world. The same applies to data. Um, instead of, I, I know that at some point I'm going to have to pull those 200 tables from that accounting system so that I can do the year-end reports. But I'm going to speak to accounting and say, what, what's the most important report you need? So instead of building all of the data model I need, and then building the entire import process and testing it, and then build, so I've got nothing of value for those uh, uh, accountants. I'm going to ask them, what's the most important report you need? build that report. If you can build part of that report first, build part of that report first. 
only pull the data you need for that report. So you're thinking about the overall architecture that you're going to need, but you're focusing on delivering the minimum amount of effort to get the outcome of getting that report in front of the, the, the users so they can tell you whether it's right or wrong or not fast enough or not delivered in the right way and you find out that stuff early and then what's the next most important report you need and do that and iteratively pull down the data it will take longer to build the data architecture you will probably have to do a number of refactors along the way but you're getting value in front of the users not only that, but you're reducing the risk that the organization has. They're not giving you $10 million and you take 10 months to produce the, 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 the reports. They're giving you $500,000 and after the first two weeks, you have a report to show them that shows the data that they can validate and check and give you feedback on and it's provided them with some value. So not only does the customer get value, you've produced the risk to the business. You've also made your development teams happier because they can see the value they're bringing on a shorter iteration uh, to the, 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 the stakeholders. I, I think it's an all round win, but ultimately it's an engineering problem to go solve. You may have to change the architecture. You may have to change uh, the technology you use to, to implement your architecture. You may have to change the way you deliver that product in order to achieve it. Um, don't get locked into anything. Everything is open to change, whatever allows you to deliver fast and frequently. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, so the next question, I'm gonna simplify it a little bit, but um, it, does a Scrum Master have to be technical? Do they have to have an engineering background or, or a development background? Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Oh, I go round and round on this one. And, and I think if, it, if the question is, do they have to have an engineering background? The answer is no, they don't have to have an engineering background. The, the, I think, however, an engineering background helps understanding whether you've got an engineering background or not as a scrum master one of your jobs is to help the team become better at delivering software to coach them into getting better at delivering software if you don't know that their devops sucks if you don't understand why their devops sucks and what maybe they could do you know things they could do to fix it or that it can be improved, you're not going to make a, 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 a good Scrum Master. You need to have enough knowledge to understand where the problems lie to help guide your development team to focus on the problems that really matter for them when they don't always see them when they're, they're, they're in the weeds themselves. Whether that be the architecture of the application is, is you know, fundamentally a dead end, the, 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 it was a good try, but we need something else. Um, whether there's some massive radical refactoring that needs to be done because technical debt is being built up in a, in, a, in a way that is not acceptable, but nobody's really, you know, not, not noticed. People have noticed, but it's not high enough on the radar, but you know it's going to be a problem later on down the line. You need enough technical knowledge to do that. Um, I like to think of a, a scrum master has three masteries. Business mastery, because you've got to help the product owner. You've got to help the product owner and the team interact with the business. You've got to have, help the product owner understand what it is they need to do, the market changes, all of those things. So you don't need to be an expert in those things. That's the product owner's job to become the expert. But you need enough mastery in that topic to be able to help and guide them. You need technical mastery to a certain degree. Um, so that doesn't mean you can necessarily code in a particular language. I, I 
don't code in Java. I have never, well, I'd say I'd never coded in Java. I did Java Beans once and it was a horrendous experience, but um, I don't code in Java. I don't code in Python. I don't code in uh, PHP. I don't really understand those languages enough to code in them, um, but I can help a team get better at delivering software, even if they're using those languages, because I understand DevOps, I understand source control, I understand what good source control looks like, what a good branching structure looks like. Um, there's always going to be nuances of the technology, but those are things you can learn and, and work through, but you have to understand the fundamentals of all of those technical things. So while you don't have to be a software developer background, you do need some level of affinity with uh, 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 the technical nature of the work that is being done. So if you're a scrum master for a team that is uh, building video and marketing material for an ad agency, then you need some level of expertise and understanding in video and marketing and ad agency work. Does that make sense? Yep. Great, thanks Martin. Yep. Um, so the next question, I'm sure you've never run into this, but um, so and I'm joking. Um, how do you handle conflicts between two people on a scrum team, um, especially if one is more of a disciplinarian type person? So yeah, that's it's a difficult problem to go solve, and in some regards it doesn't really get solved any differently than it's always been solved. When you have a disagreement with another member of your team in the old waterfall model, um, somebody taught, you know, you've got a line manager, your line managers talk to each other if they're different. Uh, the line manager talks to the employee, tries to coach them around to uh, 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 reconciling differences. If in um, all of those efforts in reconciling their differences, you know, the Scrum Masters, uh, 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 sorry, in reconciling their differences, if not, then um, the, the, the person may, or the people may need to be separated because they're not, are not getting on. That's the old world. In the new world, there's an added level um, the, the team itself, uh, 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 letting the team decide, letting the team figure out their own problems. Um, they, they, they should be able to work together to figure out how to reconcile that difference. If they don't understand how to do that, the Scrum Master can help facilitate, can help coach and train them in, in doing that. So uh, teaching conflict resolution, uh, teaching around uh, uh, professionalism, to some extent uh, a Scrum Master is a, a a little bit of a um, shoulder to cry on, uh, an agony and uh, 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 other terminology you want to use. Um, but I definitely recommend to Scrum Masters, uh, and I always teach this as part of my uh, PSM training, um, that they look at getting some cognitive therapy training um, and maybe some life coach training as well. Um, those types of, uh, uh, those, that, those additional skills help with the interpersonal problem, uh, 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 dealing with those problems, uh, getting people to talk to each other, getting people to be, uh, for want of a better expression, more professional with each other. Um, I, I've worked with a lot of people that I don't like, um, and it, personal problems have, uh, 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 personal problems um, should be able to be mitigated with professionalism, uh, but at some point, maybe you, you don't want to work with that person. So the Scrum Master gets the team to work on it, helps them figure out how to work on it. If they can't, the Scrum Master facilitate, <coughs> facilitates. If uh, uh, you know they've exhausted all the avenues, maybe it escalates to uh, line management, unless that's maybe the same as the Scrum Master, if you've got a pure Scrum organization, um, and maybe a team member has to move to another team. But you, I think you'll usually find that once you get that far down the line, somebody will voluntarily go to another team um, because you've exhausted all the avenues that are available. 
Great. I don't know if that helped. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I'm sure they'll come back if, if it didn't. I, I think the big thing is really getting the people to try to work it out. And I think that's what you're saying is, is work with yep. them as, as a scrum master, you're a coach, you're, 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 you're a mentor, you're a helper and help them to work out and understand. And in some cases, if this person is a, I think the, the words that were used in the question, a disciplinarian, um, maybe it's breaking mm-hmm. down that mindset, right? It, it, it's it, moving to a more agile mindset and getting that, that individual to understand. And we run some exercises in PSM, for example, to help really understand the importance of the agile mindset and of the team. And it's, it's about the team. It's not about the individual anymore. And well, I also think it, it, in this maybe doesn't apply to small organizations with one team, but in larger organizations, every team in your organization is going to have a different culture. Some teams are going to be more discipline orientated. Uh, some teams are going to be firing Nerf guns at each other every day. Um, that's the culture of that specific team. If somebody doesn't fit in that culture, another team might be a better option anyway, rather than trying to, if somebody is a disciplinarian and they don't like the joking around, then I wouldn't put them on a team where everybody's joking around. I'd want to have them on a team that's more suited to their character. Does that make sense as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I yep. think you're absolutely right. You've, as the teams are are organizing, you know, making sure that they're going to work well together is certainly a, an important part of that organization. Great. So um, another question we've got, which um, so uh, I, this is probably an easy one for you, but should should the scrum master always remove impediments? Ah, so. Ah, yeah, that, 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 that is a good one. So um, the scrum master should always remove real impediment. But I'm going to define a real impediment. And I put the word real in front of it. It's really just impediment. But I'm going to define an impediment. An impediment is something that inhibits the team's ability to move fast that they can't deal with themselves. but there is that they can't deal with them. So um, if I'm a scrum master and I have an impediment, I'm going to think two things. Can the team handle this? If yes, I'm not going to. That's the team's problem to go handle that. My second question that runs through my head is, should the team be able to handle this? If the answer to that is yes, and the team should be able to handle it, but maybe they don't have the skills or knowledge to be able to deal with it, maybe that's what I need to work on. Maybe the real impediment that I need to deal with is that they don't have the skills or knowledge. Um, And then further up the scale, all of those things have been tried. It's something that the team cannot deal with themselves. Then maybe I'm going to go deal with that problem. Um, but even if I have to deal with that, thinking about what training or what uh, things might I be able to provide to the team to help them deal with that problem themselves in the future. So it maybe wasn't such an easy question there. Yeah, maybe it was a little bit, uh, a bit more broader than, than I thought. Than, than I thought. And I think also part of it is you, you're not only solving the impediment, but you're helping them to solve it or um, encouraging them to solve it. Because often it's not, you know, it, it, the problem doesn't have to be, oh, okay, I'm the scrum master now. We're done with this daily scrum. We're going to go take those three impediments that came up and I'm going to go deal with them. It might be yep. coaching the, the team or the individual and in, in how to over come those and, and deal with them as well. Oh, absolutely. Yep. So I, I think um, I want to be conscious of, of time and, and the, the folks that are here. Um, so I, I don't want to take up too much more time. So I think what we'll do is uh, move on to um, the next slide, Lindsay. And uh, I want to thank everybody for attending today. 
Uh, thank you, especially Martin, for taking time out to help folks. And uh, as I said, anybody we did not get to, um, we'll try to answer those via email, or you can always reach out to Martin. I'm sure he's happy to help and uh, answer additional questions. A lot came in. I know we did not get to them all. Uh, continue your learning. Uh, we've got our learning paths for Scrum Masters, for product owners, for team development team members, and for agile leaders up on the website, all free. Uh, we try to provide as much free information and, and free learning as possible to help you as part of our mission as scrum.org to help improve professionalism, to help you continue your learning. Um, so check out those learning paths. Um, so you don't even have to sign up. Just, just go hit them. If you go to resources for Scrum Masters and so on, you'll find them there. Next slide. And with that, um, thank you very much. Join the forums. Lots of people always answering questions like these on the forums. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. And um, don't forget to read uh, the many, many um, scrum.org blogs that are written on a monthly basis. With that, again, thank you, Martin. Thank you to uh, all of our attendees. And have a great day. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Martin.